All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. So welcome to another edition of In The News. Let's just jump right into it. I guess I have to start off with the Royals since that's who everybody's talking about, right? And it's so crazy because, Lord, them Royals, they got a whole lot going on. Like, Royals, just so y'all know, this is looking very 1998 Ricky Lakish right now with your family. Um, they were never a family we paid attention to growing up. Like, we didn't talk about the Royals, maybe because we weren't interested, but thinking back, like, other than the Jacksons, the Wayans, and, and the Williams sisters, I think the only other family we might have paid attention to might have been the Kennedys. And that's only because, you know, one of them was dying every two or three years, so they were always on the news. But the Royals, I, I don't remember any... I mean, maybe other than the funeral. Like, I remember Princess Diana's funeral, and that, again, was when we were living in Italy, and we only had three channels, and the funeral was at least on two of the channels, so you had to watch. Um, but yeah, the Royals, they, they were not anybody we followed. So as I was watching, you know, this for my entertainment, because I like to watch rich people have their problems as well, um, yeah, there was a lot that was revealed, huh? But at the same time, I wasn't shocked by any of it. And I think most people, or a lot of people, kind of felt the same way. There wasn't anything that was too shocking, especially when it came to, like, the allegations of the racism and so on and so forth. Because again, you know, I know people are really into all of the celebratory whimsical castles and sprinkles and the weddings and stuff. But at the end of the day, this, this is still a family that belongs to a dynasty that, you know, pretty much colonized all but 22 countries in the world. You know, you go to some of the blackest countries in the world and they got white people on their dollar bills. You know what I mean? And so they just have a lot, a lot of blood in that lineage. And so I'm just like, there's nothing that, that's too out of the way to be shocking for me. So even when they had the piece about the baby and they were saying, oh, they were shocked because they were worried about how dark the baby might come out. I'm like, again, this is a family that once was so pressed about having a pure bloodline that they were procreating with other family members to the point where they were, you know, they didn't realize that when you procreate with your own family, there's going to be some birth defects. And so now you have, you know, a handful of relatives that, that have different conditions and everything. And they pretty much wrote those relatives off and shipped them away and wrote them off as dead so the world wouldn't know about them. And they were in different homes. I saw that on The Crown not too long ago. I was like, this family is wild. Like, I think I started paying attention to the royals when, like, CNN had... Um, that Dynasty series or something. So I started watching that. I was like, okay, this is actually interesting. Because again, Diana was the only one I knew. And, and, and I didn't know the prince's names, but I knew them, if that made sense. So after I started watching that CNN Dynasty thing, then somebody's like, oh, you got to watch The Crown. It's just good. Just skip the season four. Okay. And I went to season four. I was like, actually, let me go ahead and watch all of this. But um, yeah, they, they got a lot of dirt on that family. That family got a whole bunch of skeletons. So that's why I was like, Me uh, Megan, I don't know how you married into that. Like, there's no way. That's a family I'd have no interest in being a part of. Because again, in addition to the imperialism and the bloodshed and the incest, they just come off so boring to me. Like the royals, I, I know people again love the fairy tale stuff, but they just seem so dry as a family. Every last one of them. Like th there's just no personality. They just come off so stoic and gaunt and maiden. You know, I feel like the kids get wooden toys on Christmas, and I, I, I feel like they don't even get birthday cakes for the kids. Like, the kids get, like, unleavened bread that they can dip into sweet honey or something. Like, I just feel like they have no personality. I feel like even the furniture is boring. Like, I feel like if I go to the castle, they have those couches that you have to sit upright on. You can't even, like, slouch in them because they're not even comfortable. Like, they just seem so dry and, and uptight. And I'm like, I don't understand why. Y'all done kill all these people around the world. Y'all should just go ahead and run around like you run the show. What you, don't try to be all nimble now. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, it's interesting, but it was kind of sad to also see the bits with, like, the security and how they were willing to kind of just let, you know, whatever happened, happen to their own family. Because, again, even if you don't care for the royals, this is a very, you know, high-caliber family that has a really high public profile. And so, of course, there are the dangers that come each and every day. So I'm like, dang, even y'all own great-grandkids, y'all don't care about it. It is what it is. They ain't getting no security. Don't care. It's like, wow. But, again... I don't think they had to be too worried. Like, again, I know they try to paint Megan one way, but again, I know Megan used to run and play with her ratchet cousins like the rest of us. So I know she had security because she just got family down the street anyway. So, you know, it is what it is. But I don't know. That, that, again, that's just a family I, I'm good on. I just feel like, I feel like even their parties are boring. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that would be the most uneventful party to go to. Like, because I saw the piece where they were talking about they also invite the press and, and the paparazzi and the tabloids to the castle for events and stuff. I'm like, so y'all are stirring up the chaos. Because again, Meghan Markle has already been hit with a bunch of bad press from like UK tabloids, like just getting it at each and every day. It's one of the reasons why they were like, let's just, let's just leave, I guess. Um, and you know, I like guess Harry was saying, he just remembers what happened to his mama. So we're not going to have this happen to the wife of, and the mother of my children. And so, so on and so forth. But Again, it's just like, I feel like their parties are even boring. And th that has to be a, a new kind of boring. I remember, remember when the whole conversation about the national anthem and patriotism was going down? And I think Trump was mad about some event, so he was like, I'm going to have my own. And he was like, and you know, at our White House Christmas party, we're going to sing patriotic songs. I was like, oh, 
That sounds so boring. Like, it's supposed to be a party. Like, like Kim Park, it's supposed to be a party. It's supposed to be a party. What kind of party y'all having singing patriotic songs? I know that's dry. But you know what? I bet that party was more lit than what they're doing over at Windsor. You know, I feel like I feel like the fox trotting the waltz are even too much for Windsor. So I'm good on that. Um, but the more entertaining aspect in all of this um, for me was probably Piers Morgan. Like, Piers Morgan just having a terrible week. And I have enjoyed every minute of it. Because, one, I just think he's a terrible person to begin with. He just... He seems like somebody that doesn't have any friends, and he just seems like he can just go in and say whatever he wants, and he never gets held accountable. So I enjoyed watching him get fried up this week. So, of course, in response to the interview, the media, you know, they hit the firestorm, and everybody's dragging the, the Meghan and Harry and, you know, trying to claim that there's no racism, because that's one of the things that always happens, too. You start calling out racism, and then everybody finds racist ways to tell you that the racism isn't real. And so all of that's happening, and Piers Morgan has really been one that's just been kind of going in and dragging him, and how dare you, how dare you speak ill about the queen, and, you know, blah, blah. I was like, y'all, y'all give this woman so much. But anyway, um... So he's been frying her up, and apparently, I saw this on Twitter, he's done like at least 70 plus different really, you know, ill-fated stories on Harry and Meghan for at least in the last year, I think. And so, I didn't know the backstory of this, but apparently, and I saw this on some news show the other day, but apparently, he and Meghan went out for a date one time, right? And so they went out on a date, date was over, I guess she wasn't feeling him like that. He bought her a cab to go to wherever she was going. The cab indirectly took her to a party where she met Prince Harry and, you know, the rest is history. So I guess he feels some kind of way. He feels a little hurt in his heart. You know, Megan didn't choose him. I was like, you, sir, you didn't have a shot to begin with, if we want to be honest. Uh, you, I'm just trying to be honest. You didn't have a shot, sir. Let it go. Let that hurt go. That ego was crushed. It reminds me of, this one time, me and some old friends from college, we all just kind of got back together, had like a mini reunion. We went to like busboys and ports. And there was this woman that came with one of our friends and she came and she brought a date. And so all of us are hanging out. It's like 12, 13 of us, you know, just having us a good time. She ends up leaving, the, the, the friend, you know, she ends up leaving and we couldn't understand why. And so she left the date with us. Turned out she left to go meet some other guy that she was more impressed with. And so she left the date with us. I was like, what kind of, who does that? But then the, the worst part was like the friend or the date, he stayed. He stayed with us for like four hours. You, you, I mean, I can hang. I don't think he realized what had happened. I was just sitting here looking like, whoa, that was, that's terrible. And that's some messed up stuff to do right there, but he, he hung with us the whole four hours, so, you know, he, he got that Piers Morgan treatment. But anyway, going back to Piers Morgan, he pretty much quit his show today. I was like, I was like okay, interesting. So, he's doing his show, you know, talking his normal trash, and the weatherman decided, you know what, I didn't have enough. So, the weatherman literally, like, lights into Piers. Piers couldn't even take it. Piers just walks off the set. Just walks off, like, I'm not going to take this. I, I, I quit. And then, like, the network released a statement right after. And pretty much the state. actually, I think I have it in my phone. It was so quick, too. It's one of those statements when you're ready for somebody to just go ahead and leave anyway. They said, uh, let me turn it the long way because, you know, I'm blind. Um, Following discussions with ITV, Piers Morgan has decided now is the time to leave. Good morning, Britain. ITV has accepted this decision and has nothing further to add. You know they were tired of him. They, you know, normally when people leave the network or they get fired, you know, it's a long paragraph or two. And, you know, we've had an amazing 20-year run and it's a great relationship and we wish them the best on their next endeavors. And they have permanently created a positive change for what it is that we bring to the... None of that. They were like, he gone. That's all we got. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Pierce. <laughs> but um, it was crazy. I was like, dang, Pierce, you let the weatherman fry you up, huh? You know, the weatherman's supposed to come on there and tell everybody it's going to be a sunny day and it's going to be 60 degrees. Like, man, he made Pierce's day real cloudy, huh? Pierce couldn't take it. And see, that's what you get. You sit there and you talk all that trash and then you can't even take it. Can't even take it. Weak. Because Pierce stay talking trash. I remember when he used to be in the United States on CNN. I used to be ready to jump through the TV. And so I have enjoyed this. I don't know where he's going, but again, he's a wealthy white man, so they'll have another show for him next week. But um, again, just, just the privilege. He could not handle the smoke. Talk all that trash and dish it out. And the minute somebody claps back, you want to run. Um, I saw the other clip too. I, I don't remember the woman's name, but I saw the, the, the black woman who was frying him up like the day before too, just talking about how it's very, it's pretty much in poor taste to spend so much time trying to worry about the image of the queen and what's going on with Prince Philip. But then you want to act like all of the imperialism and racist institutions and, the, you know, colonizing all the countries in the world and all that other stuff, none of that matters, but we need to worry about the queen's feelings. That's why when they're like, oh, the queen is saddened. I was like, okay, I guess. I don't know what you want me to do with that. You know, she, they're, they're having, you know, they're going to address it behind closed doors privately. I'm like, y'all knew what was happening. All y'all was in the room watching. So, I guess. But, you know, to each his own. Again, the royals, they're, they're not really, they ain't my people. Sorry, they, I don't follow them like that. But, you know, it is what it is. We'll see how this unfolds. Um, but, again, I just, I just think that's such a cold family. And 
I didn't remember seeing the, the two boys walk behind the mother's casket. I don't remember seeing that. But looking back, I was like, that's horrible. You make your kids do that? And then, like, they didn't cry or anything. I was like, I don't know if they had to be trained to do that. But I know if that was me at 10 or 11, I had to walk behind my mama in the casket. Oh, it would have been some good TV. And I'm not even trying to joke about it. But I know they would have had to just turn the cameras off of me. The way I would have been rolling on the floor behind the horses and everything. But horrible. It's just like, mm, I don't know. If that's what you're into, that's what you're into. But... Uh, too much blood on their hands. And, and that's a lot for me to say coming from a place like America, which has just as much, you know? Goodness. Anyway, moving on. And then there's Papa John. Now, I don't think we've talked about him for a good two years and some change, but here he is in my conversation. If you remember, some years back, he got into some controversy because he pretty much made a statement where he was saying he wishes the NFL players would pretty much just kill the national anthem conversation just stop talking about it stop complaining about your oppressions and what's happened to people all around the world it just just stop because it's pissing off the viewers of the nfl and because of that the viewership is going down and because the viewership of these games are going down less people are ordering his pizzas during the hours in which the games would normally air and so he just needs everybody to stop because his bottom line is being affected and so you know pretty much he wanted everybody to just hush about oppression so he could keep making his money and the funniest bit was pizza hut dominoes were like our numbers are fine. We're hitting like record sales this quarter. I don't know what's going on with your pizza, but we're fine over here. And so, of course, he catches all this backlash and there's a whole repurposing within that company. I think they pushed him out or something or he lost some of the powers that he once had with the company and so on and so forth. So anyway, fast forward to modern times. He's on some news platform. I think it's like the OAN network. I think that's one of them crazy networks where all the cuckoo people go on there and they just spew all the racist stuff because, you know, I don't know. I think it's like an internet network. I don't know. But anyway, he's on there talking about what's happened in his life during the last 20 months and what he's been doing to do better or something. And he had had all of these priorities. Like one of the priorities was like figuring out what happened within his company and why he's in a position he's in. I forgot what the second thing was, but one of the things was cutting the N word out of his vocabulary. And we've had three goals for the last 20 months to get rid of this uh, N word. Uh, in my uh, vocabulary and dictionary and everything else uh, because it's just not true. Figure out how they did this and get on with my life. You know, it's taken him 20 months to do so. He's worked very, very hard. And I'm like, first of all, you shouldn't have told us that. You could have kept that to yourself. But then I'm like, it took you 20 months to stop saying that? 20 months to stop saying the N-word. Like, that, sir, that's not a part of your vocabulary. That's something that's cemented. Like, that, that is etched in stone and that's a reflex. It just comes out like butter for you. Like, it's almost like, you know, when you go to the store or something, and the people always tell you, thank you, have a good day. And you're like, oh, thank you, you too. And then you go to fast food or something. I don't know. You, you, you go to, to checkers or someplace. And you know, thank you, enjoy your food. And you're thank you, you too. I'm like, shoot. Same thing. That's the kind of reflex he must have with this N-word. Like, man, 20 months, huh? I'm just thinking of all the things that people can do in 20 months. You know, 20 months, that's like four Ariana Grande albums. Because, you know, she be putting an album out like every six months. That's like 30 Drake songs. I'm just, you know, Tyler Perry would have had about eight movies out by now. Like, what are you doing? Uh, the Masked Singer, you know, they got like 12 seasons already or however many seasons they got. I mean, so they've done all that. And here you are still stuck with this one word. Like, come on, how do you mess that up? You know, and the, the crazy part is like, you were the CEO of a food company. Most people love food. Like food is the way to everybody's heart. There's no way to mess up that kind of bag. You, you just got to continue to do what you do and people will support you as long as you don't do anything crazy. But really, it has nothing to do with you, you, you know, losing the revenue because of, you know, the NFL boycotts, I guess. No, you just suck at marketing. And I think I said this the last time. I will never understand for the life of me why he didn't jump on to the Khalid train. Remember when Khalid came out and he had the song Location? I just always thought that would have been the dopest marketing plan where, you know, you have the commercial, you have Khalid who's taking the order and, you know, he's singing like the little send me your location song, you know, send me your location, but just kind of change the words to make it fit with the commercial. Like that would have been the dopest commercial. And then at the end of the commercial, you know, he pulls up to the house with the pizza or whatever. What, who, why didn't y'all do that? Like literally, come on. Like again, marketing could have done everything because again, when it comes to marketing, all you need is like a, a good jingle or, you know, something memorable that people always remember. It's kind of like, is that that double mint gum commercial that people still remember from like 10 years ago where it's like, who are you calling Cootie Queen, you let her? Like that commercial, same kind of energy. I just think back to like, I remember the 90s. I feel like in the 90s, especially the mid 90s and early 90s, I feel like that's when you had like the, just the best commercials. Like remember Mentos, the candy, the fresh maker, they had the best song. Like anytime that commercial came on, you just sang along because it was just, it was like a catchy song. Same kind of energy. Mr. Uh, Papa John, that's all you had to do is just get you a good commercial to kind of bring up your advertising because your advertising was trash. That's why Pizza Hut and Domino's were, were dragging you. Speaking of Domino's, I remember, I remember when I moved back to America, this was the summer of 99, Domino's had this commercial for the heat wave bag 
And it's so funny because, you know, living in Washington State, um, the location I was in, sometimes these companies, you know, when they do their, their marketing, you get different commercials depending on where you live. So when I was in Spanaway, Washington, they had a totally different heat wave bag. I don't even remember the song. It was, you know, oh, the heat wave bag for your pizza. Some, some crap, right? And so I remember I was in Savannah that summer. Savannah had a totally different commercial. It was like this R&B, hip-hop, I swear, Dark Child produced it. Domino's heat way back. Get hot, touch. I was like, what kind of commercial? I had never seen a commercial like that. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. But like, I still remember that commercial. I wish I could find it on YouTube. But that was the most lit commercial that summer. I used to, every time it came on, I was, you know, Grandma, can we get some Domino's? Like, look, I was falling right into the trap. But I don't know what he's doing. I'm like, man, come on. Again, you, you messed up and all you had to do was serve the food. Just make your pizzas, man. You know, nobody's asking what does Papa John think about what's happening with the NFL controversy. You put yourself into that predicament. That was just, just foolish. Kind of like when Dave Chappelle used to talk about Ja Rule and they're like, oh, we, let's see what Ja Rule has to say. Same kind of energy. Speaking of food, by the way, remember some months back I was telling you guys I was looking for like a really, really good red beans and rice recipe? So I really did write down and save every last one that y'all sent. And I have tried a few of them. I haven't got to everybody's because I probably won't because there were too many people. But I'm telling you right now, Harley Lynn, you're in the running right now for the best recipe. That's the one I tried a few months back. That one actually was kind of hidden. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at some of the other ones. And, and I don't know, maybe I'll send y'all a gift card or something. But like, yeah, Harley Lynn, yours has been the best so far out of the ones I've tried. So I appreciate it. Thank you. But anyway, Papa John, I don't know. Anyway, speaking of pizzas with the name of Papa in it. I always thought Papa Murphy's was better anyway. They have it in Washington State. I don't know if it's on the East Coast, but Papa Murphy's is the one where you have to actually put the pizza in the oven. Like you go and pick it up and put it in the oven. That pizza used to hit. Like that, that was some good pizza. That's probably been my favorite next to Ann Pizza. But anyway, moving on. And then I did see Coming to America, the sequel. Mm. Um, I'll say this. I did like the movie for what it was. I appreciated it mainly for the nostalgia. It was an okay movie. It's one of those movies you watch, you don't really ever watch again unless it's a lazy afternoon and it happens to be on TV and the remote is too far away and you're comfortable because the blanket is the right temperature and the pillow is the right level so you just don't feel like reaching for the remote and ruining all of that so you sit and watch until you nod off. You know, it, it was that for me. Let me say the good though. I will say the good was one, I really enjoyed that they had most of the original cast that was available in the film. I thought that was that's what really made me like the film a lot in, in that aspect. I love seeing a lot of the original characters. Lisa still fine. Like everything was great. You know, everybody looked really good as well. And then I even liked all the cameos. I liked all of the people who were brought in. And by the way, there are no spoilers, so you don't have to worry about me spoiling it if you haven't seen it. Um, I liked all the cameos that were brought in. Uh, lots of new faces, but familiar faces. Um, and there were high points. There were still moments that were very comedic. Um, Leslie Jones, I think, is who I probably laughed at the most in this movie. Um, and so there were moments that were, were funny, but I think the issue, the plot just had so many holes in it. And it kind of just jumped everywhere. And every time you thought the movie was going in one direction, it went in another direction. Then it went, I'm like, I guess. And so I think this is the issue. One, the other bit is character development. You know, I think the reason... The first one worked so well is the characters were developed so well. Like, you know, in most movies that are good, you get introduced to the characters and you grow with the characters throughout the course of the film. And as you're growing with those characters, their mannerisms and the things that they do make their roles even funnier or, or more relatable, depending on whether it's a comedy or a drama or action film or whatever, right? And so also... When you're first getting that first movie, just trying to get it greenlit, and when you gotta go through so many offices and get told no so many times, and you have to revise the script 850,000 times, and then this person pulled out of the movie, and now you got, like, there's so many hurdles that people go through. Some of these movies take years, sometimes decades, before they even finally get to film. Kind of like The Bodyguard. Like, initially, that was supposed to be Diana Ross's movie in the 70s, but all kind of politics and everything else happening, and we don't see that movie until, what, 92 with Whitney Houston? And so there, there, there's politics behind a lot of things. But, you know, I think with the character development, what works so well in the first one, you have a character like Prince Akeem who was just so innocent and naive. But, I mean, not when he was in Zamunda, but when he got to Queens, of all places. You know, you have this innocent, naive guy who's like a, a fish out of water in a brand new city, and he goes to Queens, a place with a lot of character in the late 1980s, right? And so you watch him maneuver through all of these situations, and he never is in, like, he's always getting caught up in something and halfway in danger and never even realizes it. Like, all of that just made it so hilarious. And even the conversations in the way, just the fact that they went to New York and they're like, we need to find a wife. Let's 
let's go to Queens because that's what a Queens must be like stuff like that makes it hilarious or you know he goes to the University of the United States of America like that kind of stuff makes it so hilarious and so I think what happened in the first one is the way that his character is developed throughout the storyline it makes you really enjoy the character as well as everything else surrounding it it just becomes really hilarious and like even with him just being so happy to have a job and work at McDowell's like all of that work and so I think when you get to the sequel you know the audience we grew up with Akeem growing into Akeem and getting his princess at the end or his queen and so when you watch this new one it's a different Akeem he's very I'm not gonna say he's mean but he's now nothing like what you saw in the movie because now he's back in Zamunda he's in charge of things and so he just comes off very commanding and it's just a different kind of energy and it could have still worked but it was just like the plot was everywhere um and so it seems like with the plot, it wasn't as developed and they pretty much depended on gags and cold humor to make the movie work. And that works, but again, if you're not really attached to the storyline, you will laugh at the jokes, but they come off empty because they don't go anywhere. They don't really correlate with the context of the movie. And so it kind of just, eh, it's just all over the place. Um, like a perfect example sometimes, if you want to talk about like character development, like Best Man. It is a perfect example because I feel like Best Man and Best Man Holiday are so different, but and speaking of Best Man Holiday, quick story, let me tell y'all something. Date night. Let me tell you how I messed this up. We were supposed to see Best Man Holiday. Movie was sold out. I was like, well, you know, that's okay. Let's just see, you know, 12 Years a Slave because that's also out. And then we'll go see Best Man Holiday. So we went and saw that 12 Years a Slave. <laughs> that had to be the worst thing I have ever said. Just straight trauma. Just death and, and blood and gore and lynchings and getting whooped. And I, Nothing good happened that whole movie. It was just the worst thing you ever sat through. And I was like, okay, now we need to go and see Best Man Holiday because our, our spirits were so down. And then we go and see Best Man Holiday. We're just in there laughing, having a good time. And of course, the ending happens. It's the saddest thing ever. And it's just like, we left that night just... I'm done for the day. Let me, I'm going to bed. Like, it was just, just sad. And, and even then, like, again, with Best Man Holiday... What worked as far as like the character development, you saw all the characters in the first one. And so when you get to the sequel, now they're developed. So somebody like Regina Hall's character. In the first one, she's a little one-dimensional. She's pretty much just the exotic dancer. You don't really get to know her story. But by the second time, or the sequel, you know, they're married. She has kids. She has a career. She has her thing going. You know, Nia Long has her thing going. The, the I forgot the, the, the one who... I don't want to spoil it. Well, it came out in 2013. The, the one who dies. I forgot her, her name. But like, you know, by the time that movie ended, people in the theater were crying. Like everybody in there was crying when the mess went off. I'm like, that's how you can develop a story and people connect with it. And so, again, your plot has to really be balanced. And so I feel like if they would have just had a different plot, it could have worked because all of the elements were there. They had all the right faces. They had the budget. They had the budget. And amen for Tiana Taylor. I appreciate her being in the movie as well. Um... But it's just like the plot went everywhere. I'm like, I mean, it's still a decent movie, but it's just, you know, I, and it's also unfair to expect it to meet, you know, the, the, the standards of the first one. It is what it is. But yeah, it was just, it was okay. It was all right. I laughed in some moments. There were a lot of moments where I was going and making snacks and stuff because I lost my, my attention span, got real short. And then there were other moments where I'm like, well, why is this happening? Why are they doing that? You know, I thought a better idea would have been Maybe if they had his daughter go to the United States to go find her a king or something like that. I don't know. But, you know, I did enjoy seeing all of the, the, the guest cast and the cameos. and I, I enjoyed all of that, but it was just all right. You know what I mean? It was cool for what it was. By the way, I think some of you kept asking me my review of, like, um, the Billie Holiday movie and um, what's the other one? Judas and the Black Messiah. I talk about it on the live. I don't remember where in the live I talked about it because, you know, them lives be like two and three hours. But I talked about it somewhere in there. And somebody please tell Lindsey Graham that I said, go sit down somewhere. That man is always on the wrong side of history. And I swear he goes out of his way to make life difficult for people. And it's funny because this provision that's been written into the COVID-19 relief bill definitely affects a lot of the people in his state who have been victims of this. Now, if you follow me for years, we spent a few videos talking about what has happened to black farmers in America and how many of them have lost their land. And it's all due to loopholes within some of the policy and pretty much a lot of trickery and foolery at the hands of the U.S. government. But... One of the pieces in this COVID-19 relief bill that's supposed to possibly pass through the House and then finally be signed into law on Wednesday is that 
there's five billion dollars being allocated to what you would call socially disadvantaged farmers now a lot of them are black farmers there's also some native american farmers and latino farmers were pretty much they just they were pretty much set up to fail by the u.s government and in addition to that they will also be receiving 120 percent loan forgiveness because a lot of these people are old money from the u.s government there was so much trickery when we talk about the details i do want to read a few things before i go into my conversation just to make sure we have the right context all right kids so let's read a little bit i'll make my phone set up Black farmers in America have lost more than 12 million acres of farmland over the past century, mostly since the 1950s. A result of what agricultural experts and advocates for black farmers say is a combination of systemic racism, biased government policy, and social and business practices that have denied African Americans equitable access to markets. They're even redlining the farming, y'all. Even the farmers getting redlined. Foolery, right? Discrimination started a century ago with a series of federal homestead acts that offered mainly white settlers deeply subsidized land. Since then, local U.S. Department of Agriculture offices charged with distributing loans have frequently been found to deny black farmers access to credit and to ignore or delay loan applications. Many black farmers don't have clear title to their land, which makes them ineligible for certain USDA loans to purchase livestock or cover the cost of planting, and they have seldom benefited from subsidy payments or trade mitigation compensation. Almost all of President Donald Trump's $28 billion bailout for those affected by the China trade war went to white farmers. Today, the average farm operated by an African American is about 100 acres, compared with the national average of about 440 acres, according to the last farm census. The Center for American Progress found that in 2017, the average full-time white farmer brought in $17,190 in farm income, while the average full-time black farmer made just $2,408. Many civil rights advocates say the USDA's own practices have resulted in the loss of land and generational wealth for black families. For generations, socially disadvantaged farmers have struggled to fully succeed due to systemic discrimination and a cycle of debt. I'm going to scroll a little bit. Of the 3.4 million farmers in the United States today, only 45,000 are black, according to the USDA, down from 1 million over a century ago. Black farmland ownership peaked in 1910 at 16 to 19 million acres, about 14% of total agricultural land, according to the Census of Agriculture. A century later, 90% of that land has been lost. White farmers now account for 98% of the acres, according to USDA data. So what exactly does this mean? Now, in order to put things into the right perspective, we have to travel back in time. And like I've always said on this channel, when you start taking a look at the laws and the covenants and the ordinances and the articles and the amendments and anything that was stamped and practiced as law back then, it always correlates to what's happening right now. So pretty much long story short, what was then will correlate to what is now. And so folks, we have to go on a field trip to the past, all right? This is like the magic school bus, all right? Seat belts, everyone! However, Miss Frizzle is off. I'm substituting, and as a matter of fact, it's too many of y'all, and we all can't fit on the bus, so now this is the train. This is the, the midnight train to knowledge, and I'm calling it the midnight train because by the time I upload this, it's going to be midnight on the West Coast, and so, yes, we're, we're on the train. Mmm, L.A., <laughs> but uh, anyway, so when you go back to life after the Civil War ends, so now you have freed black Americans who are going and, and creating and building their lives, right? You also have black Americans who have come into land. And some have inherited land, some have purchased land, some, as you come into the 1900s, have sharecropped for so long and worked that land for years and years and years and years and more years and some more years and, and renegotiated and then worked some more years. They finally have earned that little piece of land that they've had to share crop for decades. You know, fa family members that died in the next generation and came in before they got some of that land. And so you had things like that. There were some policies that had come into play. So you had things like special field orders number 15. That was something that was pretty much established in Chatham County, Georgia. That's like Savannah. And that was something that pretty much allocated some specific land to be for black folks in South Carolina and parts of Georgia. Um, you had things like the Freedmen's Bureau and what they did with Sherman's land where 400,000 acres were promised to 40,000 free black people. Unfortunately, most of that land was snatched back and given back to the plantation owners just for the plantation owners to also get reparations because of all the money they lost after they had to give up their slaves. So they, were, they have been playing in people's faces for so long. But anyway, long story short, just, just for the, the sake of this, you got black folks who got some land, right? And so they're starting to farm and work their land. And let's say you had Mr. Jimmy Brown, Grandpa Jimmy Brown. Let's fast forward to say it's off 1930, right? Grandpa Jimmy Brown has lived a good life. 
He's been farming his land, he, everything right now. Sadly, he's old. He's going to glory. His time has come. Father Time came and took him home. He is no longer here. And so because a lot of black people during this era were not leaving wills, mainly because one, it was hard to find black lawyers to begin with because there weren't that many. And also white lawyers were not working with black folks like that. Like absolutely not. A lot of black folks had to represent themselves in court. And of course, they don't know the language and so on and so forth because it's already some trickery. So folks would often be set up to lose from the beginning. People didn't trust that system. People didn't trust people up top. People did everything communally and, and, and in-house. And so people just knew, you know, pretty much through word of mouth, once Grandpa Jimmy Brown is gone, this land is the family's. And so you had what you called heirs land where once a family member passed on, the land was left to the family, and the family is the heir of that land. There's no specific title given to anybody over that land, so there's not a whole lot in writing. It's kind of a word of mouth kind of thing, and you know, word is bond, literally. And so what happens is, let's say Grandpa Jimmy, Jimmy Brown lived a good life. I don't know, he had about eight kids, they had some kids, and they had some kids. And So let's say there's about 40 people now who inherit this land. All 40 people, it doesn't matter what they do when it comes to splitting the land to the government and on paper, it's just the Brown family land. That's it. Which means anybody in the Brown family, if they decide that they want to sell something, they're doing it on behalf of the full family. So if the entire family decides they're going to divide this land up evenly, let's say uh, Jimmy Brown had 300 acres. You know, if they evenly divide up that 300 acres and each person in the family has a little plot of land, all it takes is one person in that family to sell their, sell their land and it opens a bigger conversation to more chaos because now we jump into the conversation of what you call partition sales. And so if Jimmy Brown III, this is the grandson, right? Now let's say he had his little five acres. He decides he wants to just sell his land because he wants to move up north. If Jimmy Brown sells his land and I'm some bootleg, not even bootleg, I'm some, some, some terrible real estate investor or whatever, I just want to buy the land, I already know the laws of the land, maybe Jimmy Brown doesn't know this, but okay, as soon as I purchase this land, as soon as there is an exchange where I'm giving money in exchange for land and now I own Jimmy Brown III's little plot of his five acres, in reality, because of the loopholes in the law, technically, I now own all 300 acres because like we said before there is no direct title that Jimmy the third has the piece that he has is again the brown air so what I just bought I may have told Jimmy that I was purchasing his little five acres and everybody else was fine but really I just bought the whole family's land and on top of that there was a thing called the Torrens Act or that pretty much allowed it where people who were trying to purchase from these partition cells were shielded from pretty much the, the, the backlash or the obstacles or anybody trying to stop in relation to the family who were trying to stop the sale. So if me and Jimmy Brown III get into some litigation over this land and let's say Aunt Myrtle found out and she, uh-uh, don't do that because you're going to mess this all up. I'm already protected by the Torrens Act. And so psh, Aunt Myrtle, too bad. Jimmy and I already got something going, and once it comes into fruition, all of this is going to be mine. And so what happened is you had a lot of people who didn't even know that their land had been sold until the sheriff showed up with the dogs and said, it's eviction notice, y'all got to get out. And so that happened to so many black landowners and farmers during that era where because of the stipulations within the law and things that were taking place, and because the, the what you would call the inheritance wasn't really acknowledged by the government, it was really easy to manipulate and take people's land. So that was one of the things that happened. In addition to the fact that with heirs land, a lot of people were not able to develop their land depending on what state they're in. Now we talked about that a little bit and I referenced what was aired on BET's Dismantle and Disfranchise talking about specifically South Carolina where again over there with their heirs land you couldn't develop the land. You couldn't have a mortgage on the land so you couldn't build a house. You couldn't have a business on the land so even if you were farming you, you can't sell anything to anyone. You have to work within the collective of your land and who's on it and that's it because you know that's the rules. And so you had things like that take place. Um, so that was one of the issues. So a lot of people oftentimes would go and, and just sell the land to move on because there was nothing they could do with the land. You know, it was also terrible. It was also kind of revealed that say there's a hurricane that hits, you know, they're not even eligible for FEMA or if a tornado comes, they're not eligible for FEMA because again, nobody has a clear title to this land. And so you had things like that take place, but it gets even deeper because in addition to things like the Torrent Act that pretty much gave people pretty much leeway to just go and steal everybody's land. Now you have the other issue of what you call one, eminent domain where the government can come in and just pretty much snatch up the land because as you come into the 40s and the 50s and you have the creation of the interstate freeway system, now the government needs locations to go ahead and expand these freeways because now you have you know suburbs coming into play and people are moving further out from the city. So the government would often go to folks and just say, hey, listen, 
you are located in an area where we, we really want to build this eight lane freeway and so we're going to give you two options. Option one is we're going to lowball you and offer you probably an eighth of what your land is worth and you're going to take it and leave or we'll just go above you into the court system and we'll just take the land that way and hey, you'll still leave. So your choice, what would you like to do? Because we give you choices. This is America, the land of the free. You have an opportunity to choose. So which oppression do you want? So you have things like that take place. But then this is where it gets really bad. You have what you call the USDA and they have the USDA loans. This is almost like redlining, but just with farming. And so property that did not have a direct title was not eligible for USDA loans. And like we said, a lot of black farmers and landowners did not have titles to their land. And even if they wanted to go and get a title to their land, those titles cost money. And a lot of times they didn't have the cash flow to pay for the value of the land. If you were able to get, you know, 300 acres back in 1871 and now it's 1943, you know, the, the inflation alone, you're not going to be able to afford what that land really is. And so a lot of people, you couldn't get in a position to go and just get the title because you didn't have the money for it. Even if everybody put their money together, you couldn't afford that land, especially by the time you get to the 60s and the 70s. Forget about it. And so, again, it's literally people are holding on to heirs land in the 60s and the 70s. But with the USDA loans, the issue is that when it comes to these loans, if you have 600 acres of farmland, you need additional revenue to help you get into a position to start the farm. You need some seed money. It costs a lot of money to get enough seeds to, you know, spread across 600 acres. It costs money to have all of the material and the machinery, the cattle, the livestock. Even if you need to employ people, if you're a family of four people and you got 600 acres of land and it's the four of y'all, y'all gonna have a hard time working that land. You're gonna need some additional people, additional help. So these loans, these were very low interest loans that were given to farmers all across America, specifically a lot of white farmers. Now, sadly, because again, Black landowners did not have direct titles to their land. They weren't eligible for these loans. And so it put them at a disadvantage where they weren't able to build. And what happened during that? You had generational accumulation of wealth where these small white farms that may have started it, you know, with a handful of people, they get these loans, they can expand, they can hire people. Now they're able to put out more product because they can put out more product. They get bigger, they get bigger, they get bigger. They're working with corporations and companies and now they're in the wholesale market and so on and so forth. And before you know it, they're considered what you call a USDA farm. And what that conversation about USDA farms just meant is that business owners, companies, corporations, they often went to a USDA farm to purchase as opposed to the mom and pop. So again, if we go back to Jimmy Brown's family, let's say Auntie Tina had her piece of land. She was selling chicken eggs and everything. But she, again, this is not a USDA farm because they don't qualify for the program. They don't qualify for the loans. They don't qualify for any of the things that come with being considered a USDA farm. And you're not a USDA farm. If you're the big Walmart company or wherever, you're not going to Miss Tina to get her eggs because the Foster Farms chicken folks are right down the street. You know, I'm just go ahead and make a deal with them. And so you had that issue. So a lot of black people couldn't even sell to a lot of larger corporations because, again, they did not have the luxury to be considered a USDA farm. And so they weren't eligible to even do business with some companies because some companies even had line items in their bylaws where we do not purchase from farms that are not USDA approved. And so you have that happen in addition to just the racism that took place where some folks just didn't want to buy from black folks. You had that taking place. And then you also had people whose land just got stolen. One of the conversations when you talk about cowboys, one of the reasons why you had a lot of black people have to go and, and patrol their own land, because there's a conversation where people always think all the cowboys were white, but really like a, a huge chunk of them were black. But, you know, they only put John Wayne in your face. So that's what you think. But again, people's land used to literally just get stolen. And folks couldn't do anything about it because you couldn't go to the police because they're clearly not going to help you for various reasons. And so, you know, people had to patrol and do their own communal thing. And that's why you had things like, you know, cattle ranchers and cowboys that were black that would kind of work their land. But you had things like that happening in the Midwest. Um, so there were so many different things that were taking place. And that was just that part. And then when you get into the conversation of taxes, that, that's another conversation. Because as you get into those 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and as the land has developed, and the property values have skyrocketed. And you know, out here in these areas, now they have built amusement parks, golf courses, for-profit colleges, suburbs, malls, you know, anything you can think of, the, the property values have skyrocketed. And so a lot of people just got taxed out of their land, kind of like gentrification in the city where the everything around them has gone up and the cost of living and the 
property values have skyrocketed so much that now it's reflected in the taxes. And if you are not a part of a certain caliber of wealth or a certain caliber of people who have a certain caliber of cash flow, you can't keep up. So let's just say that somebody on, on that same Jimmy Brown farm, we're we going to say it's 1980. I'm going to say somebody's great, great somebody in the family got some land and um, they're retiring. You know, they've retired. They're now on fixed income. The issue with fixed income is that it doesn't sometimes correlate with inflation and the cost of living. And so depending on how long you stay there, eventually that fixed income, you're not going to be able to continue to pay the taxes on that land. Because of course, with the property values going up and going up, eventually you're going to be taxed out. So some people who were, you know, black farmers that had this land, sometimes their taxes were 30 times what it was just 15 years earlier. They couldn't afford it. They had to give up everything. They lost their land. And so people found so many ways to screw over black farmers black landowners and that's why when you come into today that's why they said 98 percent of those who own farmland are now white because black people lost everything the system was set up for them to fail from jump anybody could have easily made some kind of stipulation in the law and say okay well we recognize the conversation about direct titles but let's grandfather in anybody who came from between the years of 1865 and 1940 they could have done that they chose not to and because of that it played into a bunch of different loopholes and it gave the opportunity for a lot of people to be taken advantage of, a lot of people to lose their land, a lot of people to pretty much just be bought out, taxed out, you know, have their stuff stolen. It is what it is. And again, when we talk about something like that Torrens Act and the partition cells, that was a setup for a lot of people who really lost everything. All it took was one family member to mess up everything. And you already know how family is. It's hard. We see the royals, right? They are there losing their minds. So imagine you got 50 people all fighting over land. Everybody's going to have a different viewpoint on what to do. And if there's specific line items in law where you can't even develop the land, some people are like, let's just sell it. We can't do anything with it. And so you have that kind of issue. But if one person wants to sell or, or three people want to sell the land, but the other 43 don't. But of course, based on how the laws are set, if those three start litigation, it is what it is. And then the Torrance Act protects those three from the other 47 members of the family who are trying to get them to stop the sale. It's just, it's a game. They were playing games in folks' faces for years. And that's why I looked at Lindsey Graham so crazy when he was so pissed off about it. Because I'm like, sir, you represent the people of South Carolina. And a lot of the people who fell victim to this are your own constituents. And you over here, what? You know, and it's kind of like, just, it's just crazy. And I'm like, you didn't even have this smoke when you thought you were going to lose your election back in October, November. Remember, Lindsey Graham was on all the news networks. They're, they're killing me with the fundraising because his opponent was raising all his money. They're, they're killing me with the fundraising, guys. You got to go to lindseygram.com. Just donate anything, anything. $5, I'll take it. You, we got to definitely do it because the radical left and the Democrats are going to... And, and now he done won, so it's back to the foolery. Now he's talking about, this is like reparations. I was like, why are you saying it with disgust like y'all don't owe folks stuff? See what I'm talking about? This is why when we have these conversations around race and folks are like, oh, racism will end when you stop talking about it. No. First, you need to undo the wrongs that have been done and make people whole. You got to make right with the things that have taken place that have affected people systemically and generationally. Because again, the conversation with these black farmers is the generational wealth that was lost out on. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions, probably in the billions at this point. That's probably why the thing is $5 billion. You know, billions of money lost to, to different loopholes where people lost land. People weren't able to, able to build their businesses. And because of that, competition... White farmers, they were able to not only grow their farms, but create industry. A lot of the food industries that where we get our food from initially started from small white farms. A lot of the people that you go, whether, whether it be like some of the places where you get your bread or your eggs or your milk or even your cereals, some of these big giant corporations that are now worth billions started out as small white farms that benefited from those USDA loans. The same loans that black farmers weren't allowed to get. And that's where we are. That's why I'm like, no, I don't want to hear about anything until folks start making things right by the people and give people what is owed to them. Then folks can make the choice of whether or not they want to kumbaya with you or not. Don't tell me how to feel about what's happened to me and mine. That's all I'm saying. And to be honest, like, no disrespect. Actually disrespect because I changed my mind. You know, sometimes there's just some folks I ain't trying to rock with anyway. Some folks are just crazy. So we don't got to kumbaya with everybody. But again, make folks whole. Do right by the people. So with this, I don't even know if the five billion is enough, but it's a start. But again, it's just crazy when you start looking in the history, the origins of how many things have taken place and how people get screwed over. Crazy. And then did you all see the story coming out of Tennessee with the 150 kids that were rescued? Like these are kids that were missing. It's a part of a three month investigation where there are 240 kids that are unaccounted for. They found 150 of them. Their ages range from three to 17, but there's still 90 kids that they can't seem to find. I'm just like, it's so crazy of all the things that happens. And like 
I've said on many videos before, human trafficking is that next big thing that's going to overtake drugs when it comes to just revenue. It's become so huge. And I think a lot of people still think it's just a situation where the van pulls up next to Chuck E. Cheese and snatches the kids and drives off and then sells the kids to Thailand. It's a different ball game. If you read my description for the last few years, I've always had a link to a website called Just Ask Prevention. And it's a great resource tool to just give you insight about things to look for when it comes to human trafficking. Because now with these new forms of trafficking that take place, and one of the forms, the kids come home every day, oddly enough. They're being trafficked during the day, like during school hours. And so the parents have no idea because the parents, the kids are still coming home every day. The parents think the kids are over at cheerleading practice or, or wrestling practice or basketball practice. And, and in the meantime, you know, they're being trafficked or they're trafficking because they're now even using the kids to do the trafficking. There's so many layers to unfold, but it's a great website to just give you insight um, about what to look out for. And so also to just educate and just let people understand and recognize that it's more than just kind of what you see on, on like a Law & Order SVU type thing. It, it, there's so many layers to it now because now they're even using the kids to traffic the other kids. And one of the big elements about all of it is social media too. Social media has become a huge tool to pretty much recruit and, and get kids that way, whether it be Instagram, whether it be Twitter, you know, the kids aren't really on Facebook like that. That's kind of the older audiences, but th there's all kind of things that are taking place. So just be vigilant. It's one of the reasons why I think people who might follow me on something like Twitter get annoyed because, you know, I stay retweeting all the missing kids. I, I know it might come off as annoying, but then I always remember, well, listen, if it was somebody I knew, I'd want somebody to do the same for me. So, you know, it is what it is. But there's so many crazy things happening in the world, right? And then just to kind of wrap up because this video is kind of getting there as far as that time length, these last few in the news have all been almost like an hour long. Um, you know, I saw Kenneth Walker. The charges have permanently been dropped in relation to everything that was happening with Breonna Taylor. Kenny Walker is the boyfriend who felt that, you know, somebody was breaking into his house, so he fired the warning shot. And the police twisted that entire story and said, oh, well, he shot at the police after we announced ourselves. Mind you, they did a no-knock warrant. I'm like, get y'all story together. Figure out what y'all want to do, how y'all want to put this out there. So you have that taking place. Derek Chauvin's trial is starting the beginning phases. I don't know how it's going to go when it comes to them getting a jury because I feel like this has been such a huge story in relation to George Floyd. Everybody knows what happened. Um, and so it will be interesting to see how this goes. I know they're having some difficulty with debating on whether to charge him as well with third degree murder. And the issue they're running into is they have to have these charges before the case starts. They can't start introducing the case and then halfway through it, oh, well, while we're at it, we're going to go ahead and add third degree murder as well. You got to have it all beforehand. So you have that happening. And so there's a whole lot going on. Um, but, you know, we'll see. And then e e even Georgia, we've talked about this voter disenfranchisement that's taking place and the laws that are coming into play. Now, when we now when I did the live on Thursday, it was up to 253 different pieces of legislation that are going forth that are somehow going to make voting difficult for more people across the country. It's now more than 253. I forgot the full tally because I, I just saw there's another case in Iowa as well. Even Iowa, they got some foolery. You know, they're making it where they're getting rid of, you know, the, the extended early hours of voting. So they're cutting the early hours down. And they, they, I'm like, y'all just, anything you can do to stop people from voting. If you have to cheat, it should tell you something that people probably ain't rocking with y'all like that. It, it's crazy. Folks want to hold on to power so bad and they are willing to do it by any means necessary. So pay attention to what's happening in your local politics. I know politics got a lot of foolery going on with it, but it's only going to continue to be a, a bunch of chaos if we continue to keep a blind eye to what's happening around us because we're trying to make a point. I feel like you still need to somehow utilize whatever a little crappy game they got figure out their stupid game and learn to use it against them for those who are trying to make your life difficult um because i even saw well at least the one good thing i'll say georgia that y'all got right i saw y'all finally ended the whole citizens arrest mess we've done some videos on that too i'm glad y'all got rid of that crap because there's too many people running around here thinking that they're the police there's too many people running around here with their own interpretation of the law and what's right and what's wrong and they're purposely going out here targeting people and looking for something to jump into it's why you keep having all of these vigilantes that keep killing folks. You know, they, they go looking for trouble. I wish somebody would try to pin me down while I'm at the mall. Crazy. Anyway, um, that's all I got for you guys tonight. Like I said, please, please stay safe in this chaotic world. And anyway, we will catch up until next time. So share your two cents. Subscribe. I'm out. They said they couldn't ride to the music cause it's way too melodic They despise anything that makes sure it's feel erotic Take a mile past the strip, the windows down to the scene Stepping out on the weekend as the crew's routine Cause they act up, fall back up and all the girls are mad up The DJ spins the record and the lines begin to stack up Take a step into another deeper dimension While you balance out the moments that should give you attention Set, well you such an actor, taking pictures faster Seeking validation from the ones you used to laugh at Wait, here's a question that they never really ask us If you had a million, would you spend it on your passion? we're working on a death and to catch up on our rest and if you wanna be the best, they claim you have to ace a test. Then we diss a whistle check. Why you blowing up my text?
Saturdays. I don't work on Saturdays. See, my life is not your death, and that's the reason why I choose life.